My name is Remington Aidney Campbell, and this is the History of Musical Theatre Podcast. Episode 1. Why Oklahoma? If I were to ask you what the first musical was, and I assumed you were somewhat versed in musical theatre history, your answer would probably be Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a show with music by Richard Rodgers and lyrics by Oscar Hammerstein II. It's based on the play Green Grow the Lilacs by Lynn Riggs, the original production opened at the New York Guild Theatre in 1943 with direction by Ru- Ruben Mamillion and choreography by Agnes DeMille. The thing is that you'd be wrong. Sort of. It's complicated. Don't feel bad, though. It's become part of musical theatre mythology. I initially started researching Oklahoma because I wanted to start this podcast with the first musical. Even the Oxford Companion to the American Musical repeats this myth, saying it was the first fully integrated musical play, and its blending of song, character, plot, and even dance would serve as the model for Broadway shows for decades to follow. No song from the score could be assigned to another actor, no less another show, because each was drawn from the character so fully that it became an integral part of each character's development within the plot. The songs in Oklahoma continued plot development and characterization rather than interrupted it. This is where it gets tricky. The Oxford Companion is completely right. Except for the first eight words, it was the first fully integrated musical play. Which isn't exactly true. Firstly, we don't have one definitive definition of what an integrated musical is. The Oxford Companion has a good definition, which is a really solid framework for determining what is and isn't an integrated musical, but it does leave out some useful definitions. Some define integration as a fusion of score and scene, in a technical sense. The actors continue talking as the music begins under them, for example, or a break is taken in the middle of a song to say a few words. Another definition focuses more on choreography. The new integrated musical used its choreography as part of the storytelling, rather than as a separate form of entertainment. No longer is there a random tap number because our leading man taps really well. The dance was in service of the story. Oklahoma did this brilliantly. The choreography fitting the story was a hill choreographer Agnes DeMille would have died on. This includes dances which are influenced by the time and place, as well as by character, and sections of the story conveyed primarily through dance. So who are the contenders for the first integrated musical crown? Firstly, Showboat. While the Oxford Companion to the American Musical lists Oklahoma as the first musical, the New Groove Dictionary of Music and Musicians gives credit to the 1927 musical Showboat. As a brief aside, the New Groove Dictionary of Music and Musicians is either the coolest or the lamest name for an academic text, and I can't decide which. It gives two glowing pieces of praise to Showboat. Firstly, that it is perhaps the most successful and influential Broadway musical play ever written. And secondly, that it impelled composers of Broadway musicals to concern themselves with the whole production, as opposed to writing Tin Pan Alley songs for integration. Basically, you didn't just write a song that could be in any show. Even Richard Rogers gives some credit to this idea. In an interview later in life, he credited showboat composer Jerome Kern with starting all of this. He was somewhat less forthcoming about what all of this was, but he undoubtedly admired the composer and saw him as really key to the development of the musical. He was also a fan of showboat's lyricist, Oscar Hammerstein II. Yes, that Oscar Hammerstein. 
Something notable about a lot of the innovations which happened in musical theatre pre-Oklahoma is that Rodgers and Hammerstein weren't separate from them. They each have a show on this list. The show was produced by Florian Ziegfeld. If you're thinking that name sounds strangely familiar, it's because Ziegfeld is a certified early musical theatre big deal. He was a producer of the Ziegfeld Follies, which was the show that solidified the idea of Broadway musicals being all about leggy chorus girls. The Ziegfeld Follies get mentioned in a number of other Broadway shows, including Sondheim's Follies, which focuses on the reunion of a bunch of performers years after the fact, Funny Girl, which is a somewhat biographical tale of Fanny Bryce, one of the performers, and The Will Rogers Follies, which looks at Will Rogers' time in the Ziegfeld Follies. Showboat was immensely successful. It spent two years on Broadway, a year on tour, and then played 200 more performances on Broadway. And all of that in the age before the long-running musical. As Phantom plays its 18 bajillionth performance, it's easy to forget that there used to be a time when a hundred shows was a long run. And years was definitely not the norm. It did use songs to progress its story, both diegetically and non-diegetically. If you don't know what those words mean, there will be definitions next week. The team also stayed true to the plot of the novel they were adapting. So why isn't Showboat remembered as the first musical? Well, it is by some, the New Groove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, for example. But not universally. Not like Oklahoma is. Why is that? Well, it's maybe an opera, sort of? It's complicated. It had lyrics from an operetta lyricist. Most of Oscar Hammerstein's work up until Oklahoma was in operetta. A reviewer called it the most distinguished light opera of a generation. In 1954, it became part of the New York City Opera's rep, and has since gone on to join the rep of countless other opera companies. Let me give you a quick heads up. The question, is it a musical or is it an opera, is a big one on this list. Speaking of, in 1931, George and Ira Gershwin wrote of The I Sing. It was the third longest running show of the decade and ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize. A grand total of 10 musicals ever have won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. A Chorus Line, Fiorello, Hamilton, How to Succeed, Next to Normal, Rent, Rogers and Hammerstein's South Pacific, A Strange Loop, Sunday in the Park with George, and finally, or firstly, of the icing. Unlike Showboat, Of the Essing is not a frequently revived show. Its sequel, Let Them Eat Cake, is likewise unknown. I hadn't really heard of this show when I started researching, except for briefly that I knew that it had won a Pulitzer Prize. The show follows a similar format to a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, with an equally farcical plot, something about a long-lost descendant of Napoleon maybe becoming president? It's a political satire, in the same vein as Strike Up the Band, which the pair had written the year before. Of the Essing stood out, though, because of the way the music was used to progress the plot. Similarly to Showboat and to Porky and Bess, which I'll talk about next, it falls largely within the operetta tradition. Before Oklahoma opened in 1943, Porgy and Bess had already seen a revival. The show, with music by George Gershwin and lyrics by DeBose Haywood and Ira Gershwin, opened on Broadway in 1935 and was revived in 1942, the year before Oklahoma. It was George Gershwin's attempt to create a purely American opera. The Reader's Digest, Golden Age of Operetta, says this of the show. If Gershwin had left no other music, he would be considered great by this alone. I'm not sure I have to explain again why its place in musical theatre history is a little contested. The original plan was to produce it with the Metropolitan Opera, but the Guild Theatre offered more rehearsal time and more performances. In the history of the integrated musical, believe me, the Guild Theatre punches above its weight. 
There was also the problem of finding operatically trained black singers. Broadway was desegregating. Slowly and imperfectly, but it was happening. Black performers like Bill Bojangles Robinson were headlining shows. But opera companies weren't. Being a performer of any kind is always a risky career. But for a black performer to think about training seriously in opera really didn't make sense as a financial bet. A production at the guilds helped with this, allowing them to cast a wider net rather than casting exclusively within the opera company itself. So was Porgy and Bess just an opera produced on Broadway? No. At least the revival wasn't. The main difference is recitatives. Recitatives are actually something which separates operetta from musical theatre in a lot of cases. It's the weird speak singing that happens in shows like Les Mis. Something Rotten makes fun of this in their big production number, A Musical. The singing is often rhythmic rather than melodic. In many cases, it doesn't rhyme. It's designed to do the job of dialogue. The original Porgy and Bess use these recitatives, but the revival replaced them with spoken dialogue. So the revival probably was a musical, but maybe not the original? In both cases, however, the music was used to progress the plot. Poggy and Bess is often revived, and it's remained one of the most popular opera musicals to this day. This last one is less likely to be credited as the first musical, but often does get called the first show to use dance as part of its storytelling. The distinction there between just first show to use dance and first show to use dance in its storytelling is important. I gave all my integrated musical definitions earlier, and one of them was about the dance, about fitting the dance to the story. That is what On Your Toes did. It had music by Richard Rogers and lyrics by Lorenz Hart. They also co-wrote the book with George Abbott. The more important George on the production team, though, was George Balanchine. If you know anything about ballet, and particularly about American ballet, you know George Balanchine. He was crazy influential. He's often credited as one of the fathers of American ballet and is the founder of the New York City Ballet Company. So pervasive was his work that there are a number of ballet companies who identify as Balanchine companies, using his specific version of ballet technique, and they often produce his shows. On Your Toes was the first musical he ever choreographed. On Your Toes is also the only show on this list of maybe it was a musical before Oklahoma that comes from the world of musical comedy rather than the world of operetta. The plot centred around the production of a new jazz ballet, Slaughter on 10th Avenue, and the attempted murder of its leading man, Junior. The central innovation came in the second act. All the typical musical comedy drama has ensued and the ballet is being performed. Junior, obviously in the principal role, is dancing on stage, and the hitmen come to try and kill him. Unfortunately, it's quite hard to shoot someone who's leaping about a stage. Then, musical theatre history happened. Slaughter finished, and Junior keeps dancing. Mainly to avoid being shot. But in that moment, the dancing transferred from just being something in the show to a central part of the storytelling. Porgy and Bess had a mid-range first production and has become subsequently more popular in its revivals. On Your Toes did the opposite of that. It had a really successful premiere production, and since then has kind of fallen out of favour. It has all the weird trappings of a musical comedy, and that's not 
really the thing anymore. What has survived from the show, though, is Slaughter on 10th Avenue, which is now performed as a standalone ballet by the aforementioned Balanchine companies. I'm going to link in the show notes and in the description a video of Catherine Morgan, former New York City Ballet and Miami City Ballet soloist, performing one of the leading roles. I love everything I've seen of this ballet, and one of my great sadnesses is, is how much of musical theatre choreography, especially historical choreography, gets lost. So please enjoy. <laughs> said, why do people believe these myths about Oklahoma? I have three main reasons. Number one is that musical theatre history isn't really taught. If you study drama, either at school or in a university program, you probably have a passing knowledge of theatre history. It starts with the Greeks, then comes Commedia, miracle and mystery plays, Shakespeare, and then Moving forward through the great modern masters, we discover Chekhov and Stanislavski and their partnership, and you learn about Brecht, and about how no one does Brechtian shows in a Brechtian fashion because no one wants that. You might learn about absurdism, about Tom Stoppard plays. Musical theatre history doesn't get that. We don't do that with musical theatre history. We do our history by assumptions and anecdotes. Here's an example. If you were going to start auditioning for musicals, and you should, it's fun, you would need an audition book. Now, your book is a collection of cuts from songs which you can sing at almost a moment's notice in any audition situation. One of the really important things about your book is that it needs to be varied. There's really no good reason to have 16 songs that show the same range and the same character. There's no good reason to have 16 songs in your book. Cut that back. You don't need them. So what do you need in your book? Well, if you were to Google it, which is a good way to find that out, you might come across this Theatre Nerds article, which says that you need a Golden Age song, a jazz standard, something from Stephen Sondheim, something from a rock musical, a contemporary musical, and finally, a Disney song. The article has some anecdotes to give you some idea of what those categories are, but what it doesn't do is give you a comprehensive history. Do you learn from that article that jazz standards are the realm of musical comedies, whereas the Golden Age started after that with Rodgers and Hammerstein? Well, maybe, if you're reading carefully. This is not a judgement of theatre nerds. They have a really awesome website with lots of resources for theatre nerds. They have BuzzFeed style quizzes and recommended song lists for different vocal types, and information about jobs in theatre that you might not think about. It's kind of an amazing website, but what it doesn't do is give you a comprehensive history. We also make assumptions based on stylistic things that we know about shows. I'm a massive Sutton Foster fan because I'm a human with a pulse. And she's known quite well for her roles in old school tap musicals. She's won two Tony Awards, both for old school tap musicals. The first was for Thoroughly Modern Millie and the second for Anything Goes. Both are tap-heavy, but they actually sit on opposite ends of the musical theatre chronology. Thoroughly Modern Millie is a 2000s musical, based on a 60s movie set in the 20s. The movie was actually meant to be a film adaptation of The Boyfriend, but the rights were too expensive, so they just sort of threw a show together. Anything Goes is a 1930s musical comedy which has had extensive rewrites every time it's been revived. 
Songs are pulled from countless Cole Porter shows and shoved in there to get it to look as integrated as possible. I love both these shows, by the way. But neither show is a museum piece of a 20s and 30s musical comedy, and neither is separate from it. You might have noticed that I've been using the term musical comedy to mean something different from musical theatre. And I don't just mean funny musicals. Oklahoma's pretty funny, it's not a musical comedy. But if you've noticed that, you're quite perceptive. Congrats, gold star. Is it possible to give someone an audio gold star? Can I make that a thing? Anyway, I'm going to be going into a lot more detail about what all the different subgenres that I've touched on here are and what they mean and what shows fall into those categories next week. But for now, just bear with me. Not the point of the episode. The point of the episode is why people think Oklahoma was the first musical. So back on that note, reason number two is that people do history by hindsight. There's debate over whether Oklahoma deserves the title of first musical, but you know what there's not debate about? Whether Oklahoma was influential. Oklahoma completely changed the theatre industry, and did it quite quickly. Rodgers and Hammerstein shows became mainstays on Broadway. They wrote one about every two years, and the productions often ran longer than two years. There was a significant amount of time when Oklahoma and Carousel were playing opposite each other. One of the big ideas in the season that I'm going to be looking at is actually the way that theatre changed because of Oklahoma. So don't hear discussions about whether it's the first musical as me doubting its importance, because I don't. If anything, I think it's far more important than I did when I started this research as well as the increasing number of Rodgers and Hammerstein written, Rodgers and Hammerstein new into it in musicals, other people started copying this trend and writing Rodgers and Hammerstein-esque shows. The pair actually produced other people's works, meaning that their tastes became pretty influential. As I've talked to people about this project, I've had to define what an integrated musical is about 87,000 times give or take. And after I've done that, there's the obligatory Q&A session, where people ask me if XYZ musical is integrated. One of the important things I've actually learned from this process is that integrated musical isn't as neat of a category as it might seem, especially post-Oklahoma. Integrated-ish or not exactly a musical, not exactly a musical comedy, is a legitimate category that a lot of shows in the 40s and 50s fell into. Musical comedies were being rewritten to be more and more like musicals. Earlier I spoke briefly about Anthony Goes, and you'd be shocked at the differences between the original production and the 2011 production. But it wasn't unique in this way, a lot of shows got these rewrites. It's really easy to do history by hindsight, and Oklahoma leading to a massive industry shift makes it even easier. Of course Oklahoma would be the first musical. It did all this. That's understandable. But it's still wrong. And the final reason is that the production team made the claim first. During the first two months of Oklahoma, a socialite and theatre critic named Elsa because Frozen doesn't have a monopoly on Elsa's, went to see the show. She recalls speaking to Ruben Mamoulian, or Mamou, if you don't want to sound dumb because you mispronounced it, like me, and he claimed to have created a whole new art form. He said it is the integration of the dance, music, and dialogue, an integration I've been trying to achieve for the last 20 years. Way to toot your own horn. This claim continued to be made in the publicity around Oklahoma. It gives away the lie a little bit, doesn't it? If you're advertising something as the first version of a thing that there is already discussion about the existence of, 
it's hard to believe your claim. If I started saying, I have created the world's first blippity bloop blop, come see. But you'd read an academic paper on a blippity bloop blob, then my claim starts to look dubious. As a little aside, I really wish that there was academic discourse around blippity bloop blops, and I'm gonna have to invent what they are in order to do that. But please note that when I do, I'll be the first, and I'll let you know. Even Richard Rogers knew that this claim wasn't totally true. Writing in 1975, everyone suddenly became integration conscious, as if the idea of welding together song, story, and dancing had never been thought of before. Integration was happening, piece by piece across the many genres of musical theatre that existed at the time. Next week, I'm going to be laying out the world of musical theatre as Rodgers and Hammerstein would have known it, with all its many subgenres. If you want to know the difference between a musical, a musical comedy, a play with music, and an operetta, or if you want to know how the idea of Broadway as beautiful, leggy chorus girls became a thing, or if you want to learn more about how even in a largely racially segregated industry, black performers found themselves in some of the most influential and long-running shows of the decade, then tune in. Until then, I hope you have, oh, such a wonderful day. Special thanks to Oliver Parker, who edited the show, and Javier Escarot, who recorded the musical interviews. The History of Musical Theatre podcast is an Out of the Wings podcast.